Okay, so good afternoon, everyone. Happy Monday. This is Audrey Russo, President and CEO of the Pittsburgh Technology Council. And today, like every day since the beginning of the pandemic, we are hosting a noon show. And we have, as always, a fabulous guest. Today, our guest is joining us from Manhattan. And I think you're going to be pretty thrilled to just have a, an opportunity to hear from him and uh, entertain some questions. So we're pretty excited about that. Before we get started, I just want to tell everyone that, you know, we couldn't do this without Huntington Bank. They've been our partners right from the onset and uh, have worked with us on every piece of experimentation in terms of media and um, marketing. And I want to give a shout out to Jonathan Kirsting. He's joined us here today. He's vice president of all things media and marketing. He's going to keep his eye on the questions. So uh, we launched this series right at the beginning of the pandemic to keep the community tethered and informed and to showcase some of the world changing innovation that's not just occurring here in Pittsburgh, but around the world. And today by having Neil Mittal with us from ENIAC Ventures, he's going to be talking to us about his work. And he, as I mentioned earlier, he's based in Manhattan. So. We have muted your microphones. That's only to be considerate of our guests. And then where there is a chat. So I'm asking all of you to just put your questions in there. Jonathan will keep his eyes on it. And this is not an opportunity for selling your wares or your services. This is just an opportunity to ask questions of our guests. So I'm gonna jump right in. And I, I mentioned earlier, I'm gonna reintroduce him. He's Nihal Mata. He is the founding general partner of ENIAC Ventures. And I think we met him a while black. The world is like a blur right now, but Neil, thanks for joining us. You're in New York City and uh, safe and sound. And you've reported to us that things are going swimmingly in New York. So thank you for being here. And let, let's just, before we start, let's just talk about who is Nihal? Who is Nihal the man? What is he up to? What's his journey been? And then we'll jump into talking about some of the work you're doing with ENIAC Ventures. Sounds good. So who are you? My name's Nahal. Hey, guys. First of all, shout out to Pittsburgh. You guys uh, mm. crushed it this past uh, weekend and last few days. And uh, I was mentioning to these guys that Pittsburgh's been in the spotlight for the nation and the world um, for all good reasons. And uh, you should really be proud. Uh, of yourselves, we, we all are. So round of applause to everybody in Pittsburgh. All right. Um, I, uh, you know, my uh, kind of TLDR is I've been in tech, you know, for the past two decades. Um, the first decade built a bunch of startups, uh, five startups. Um, most of them failed. Uh, a couple did of them, any of them succeed. A couple of them did. Um, you know, we learn the most from, from our failures, of course. And um, my very first startup was with another Pittsburgh native, right? Um, we were just talking about him, VJ Chada, right. who's my best friend, college roommate. We started a, a business out of our dorm room um, senior year in 1998, 1999. And that was a spectacular failure in 2001. We actually had to uh, file for bankruptcy as like young, young Indian, uh, son, you know, sons of Indian immigrant, 22 year old <laughs> entrepreneurs. Like we were like the laughing stock. Um, actually, it's a funny story because Diwali is our, uh, in, in Indian culture is our big holiday. It's next weekend. And, right. it, you know, it, it's the festival of lights and it's our new year. Um, and we used to joke that like at the Diwali parties in 1999, we were like the hit of the party. Um, and in 2001, all the aunties were like, don't talk to him. He, he filed for bankruptcy, you know? So it was a pretty, uh, it was a pretty humbling experience. Um, looking back on it now, uh, you know, Bija and I talk about this all the time, you know, it was the best experience because to face failure, especially at that young of an age mm -hmm. and to kind of have to dust yourself off, you know, and pick yourself back up, um, it's the number one tenet of being a, a good entrepreneur. It's that grit, is that resilience. And we were very lucky to have uh, failed first and, and failed fast. And now I'm on the other side of the table, you know, as an investor, and I often tell entrepreneurs to fail fast, ideally not on our dime, like fail 
way before we invest. But <laughs> oftentimes, you know, uh, when we meet serial founders and they failed before, it really resonates with us um, because you accumulate this muscle memory and this scar tissue, uh, whether you're conscious about it or not. You know, you see around corners, you don't make the same mistakes, like your body doesn't let you do that. Um, and so, you know, that's something that we look for and, and really value having felt it ourselves. Um, so yeah, so first decade I was building and, and uh, failing at startups. Um, second decade started investing, um, you know, some of the companies you've heard of, uh, Airbnb, Uber, uh, Attentive, uh, boxed, bungle, um, you know, there's a bunch of zeros as well. Of course, that's the way that startups work. But over the past, I think since 2005, since I started angel investing and the fund has been around now for 10 years, um, I've probably invested in about 200 companies, um, about 120 through ENIAC and, and others, you know, through um, previous to ENIAC as an angel. So that's kind of my really brief history um, as an entrepreneur and an investor. Well, so can I ask you just a question about that first failure, which you sure. actually declared bankruptcy with? What, yeah. was that? what was that idea? So it started as, so VJ and I actually were DJs on campus. We were, we were the cool kids, believe it or not. This is way before the wife and the kids and the dog. We were actually, you know, we we're actually the, the cool kids on campus. And, um, we used to, you know, we used to throw events and parties and we used to know kind of where the, where the coolest events were. And we started, it started with an email list and we used to email our friends um, where to go. And then we just said, let's stand up a website because that was the cool thing to do in 1998. Um, and so the website was called phillytonight.com. And uh, that's what we raised money for. Um, we spent the money very wisely as well. We had a billboard on 95 like in between Philly and Delaware. Um, we had uh, commercials on MTV produced by The Roots. Um, mm -hmm. So, you know, we, we spent that, we spent the money we raised very, very well without any, without any uh, money in the other column, which is the revenue column. We had a lot of, we had, we had a lot of money in the expenses column. But, um, but yeah, that, that was a business. It was called phillytonight.com. And then we ultimately expanded to a company called Urban Groove, which was like, 20 Philly tonights all over the world that we would either own or partner with. And the business model was, it was, it was very ambitious because it was pre Google, but it was a national ad network um, that would distribute as locally. So the vision was we would go to a Pepsi or, or a national brand and actually be able to disseminate ads across the network. Um, and, you know, at that time ad sales was all, very manual. There were no networks that could um, backfill your inventory, right? This is pre-Google. So um, obviously now that's a little bit easier to monetize those businesses, but back then it was just literally dialing for dollars and showing up at people's doors to collect collect cash, which, um, you know, two small Indian guys were not really good at. So so you, you, you went bankrupt, right? I yeah. mean, that's very, very severe. Yeah. How did you bounce out of that? You know, it took it took a lot of time. Actually, it was it was definitely looking back. It was definitely a period of depression for for Vij and I. I mean, right. um, you know, so this was in 01. Interestingly enough, you know, the entire market collapsed. You know, right. obviously 9/11, the the dot com market, the stock market, um, and you know, we we blamed ourselves for like the dot com crash. We're like, you crashed you crashed the market. Oh. And, you know, it turned out, you know, there were thousands of, of other startups that went bankrupt too. Um, but yeah, you know, we, we both went and kind of had to recover from that. Um, Vige went back home to Weirton, West Virginia. Right. And um, ended up working with his, uh, with his dad to create uh, the first seek uh, National Sikh exhibit at the Smithsonian in DC. So um, he's, he's Sikh and uh, that was an incredible effort, you know, especially coming from that sort of experience. Mm -hmm. And then we actually ended up starting a, a nonprofit called Ahimsa that post 9-11 immediately started benefiting 
uh, victims of hate crimes. So if you remember after 9-11, a lot of a lot of Sikhs, a lot of Muslims, a lot of brown people were targeted um, uh, uh, you know, th through these horrible hate crimes. And so we ended up, um, you know, throwing events and, and back to our roots, DJing, right, um, to help raise money for their families. And so we created a nonprofit called Ahimsa that's still alive and well today. Um, but, you know, that, that came out of that. Uh, that came out of that period of depression. Um, one of the things that I did, we, we actually built an interesting piece of technology at Philly Tonight and Urban Groove where we would text you, and this is way before SMS was cool. Um, we would text you um, the event of interest that night to your phone. Uh, and we built that at Philly Tonight. And so when we filed for chapter seven, um, I actually bought back the asset um, because I thought this technology would be, would be interesting to do, um, like to keep iterating on. And so, I ended up moving to San Francisco in 2001. I had actually lived there for a summer in college working for Microsoft. And I was there in 98 actually. And, and that's when I saw the big Yahoo billboard and I was like, oh my God, this is like where all the techies live. I need to be here. And so I knew I had to go back there. Um, and this was a good reason to do that with, you know, with nothing and just kind of build from the ground up like a lot of other people were at that time in 2001. But I had this interesting piece of technology um, with me. And so started iterating on it um, and ended up creating a new company and leveraging that tech to help businesses reach their customers. So instead of a B2C application like Philly Tonight was, um, making it B2B. And so we started working with record labels and artists um, and then eventually we're working with McDonald's and Starburst and eventually we're powering campaigns like American Idol. Remember in 2002, you could text in to 2003, actually you could text in to vote on your favorite contestant. That was our technology that eventually would power these, these amazing campaigns. So that was, um, and of course, VJ, um, after the nonprofit, he discovered his true passion and I think niche in life, which uh, he's an absolutely incredible top 0.0001% uh, marketer yes. and publicist, as you know. Yes. And he was doing all the PR and, um, you know, it, it, at Philly Tonight and, and Urban Groove. And so when this new company was launching, of course, we partnered with him and he's, we became his first client in his new PR firm. And so uh, this company was a rocket ship. It was called Ipsh, I-P-S-H. Um, mm -hmm. Actually, Vijay and I, bought the domain as DJs because that's the sound a record makes when you scratch it, ipsh, ipsh, ipsh. Mm -hmm. Record for those that you are listen, uh, who are listening who don't know what I'm talking about is a, uh, is a, <laughs> a circular disc made of black plastic and it has grooves in it. Um, Fascinating. It, it's crazy. It's, mm -hmm. it's like crazy. the future of technology and you put a needle on it and it creates sounds. And so anyway, when you scratch a record, um, it, uh, it made this sound ipsh, ipsh, ipsh. So we bought the domain name, and of course the genius of Vij, he, later on he backfilled the acronym for the company, became Instant Power single-handed. Uh, that's great. Um, but anyway, yeah, we, we grew that up and then ended up selling that business to Omnicom, a large ad holding company in 2005. And so that was like my first run at startups, mm -hmm. checkered, you know, bankrupt, bought the assets and then built a successful company. But it was a nice, you know, essentially seven year run um, through those companies. That was my first cycle of entrepreneurship. And so here you are at, at, on the other side of the house now doing investments and some great investments, mind you. So what? talk about that hat and talk about what the priorities are that you have. What do you look for? Yeah. Um, what's been luck? What's been intentional? Sure. So, you know, one thing I have to say is, you know, I, my partners, um, are incredible. We also all met in college in Philly um, as as engineers, and and the four of us, myself included, all had that kind of same experience. Our first decade of our careers, founding and operating startups, a bunch of them failed, a bunch of them succeeded. Then we started angel investing together and said, let's let's do this together. And 
the namesake of our firm is from the first automated computer that was actually built at the University of Pennsylvania um, in the 1940s. That computer was called ENIAC. And we are very interested in the future of computing and how that will disrupt traditional businesses. And so that, you know, that's been the overarching theme for, for, for 10 years. Um, we're investing in startups that leverage computer science or leverage code to create very dramatic disruptive businesses. Um, we love to look for kind of the, un the unsexier the business, the sexier they are to us. So you're looking at prop tech, construction tech, FinTech, healthcare, health tech, um, you know, nobody gets out of bed faster than we do when somebody says, hey, we have a new um, way to automate uh, claims recovery for healthcare payers. We're like, what? You do? You know? Um, so, um, you know, that that's the kind of stuff we're doing now. I think the, the best type of computer science these days that we're really excited about that's straight down the middle for us is machine learning, um, which, of course, in your backyard, you have one of the best centers for at Carnegie Mellon um, and applied machine learning to, you know, these very large kind of trillion dollar GDP categories. So I mentioned some of them, but, you know, real estate, construction, healthcare, mm -hmm. and tech, et cetera. So that's what's, that's what gets us really excited. Um, historically, we've been half and half kind of consumer enterprise. I think in the past few years, we've been more enterprise SaaS. We just think there's there's wider lanes for companies to to grow faster and build bigger companies. They're not kind of um, inhibited by the incumbents on the consumer side that can buy network effects like Google and Facebook and Apple. Um, there's it's a much more vast playing field on the B2B world to build unicorns. Um, but yeah, you know, we've been investing in about 10 uh, companies every year, you know, uh, or more for the past 10 years. And, you know, you can go to ediac.vc to see some of our portfolio. So what's the range of investment? What's that from ENIAC? I mean, because yeah. I, you mentioned that all of you, I'm, I would imagine dabble as well and are angels. But yeah. So, about? yeah. So we actually now as of probably five years ago, have a pretty strict ownership, um, Target. So we're seed stage invest, uh, investors. So we're investing when there's a team uh, and there's a product. Um, there's usually little traction. So these companies are not okay. generating, throwing off cash flow, generating tons of revenue, but there's a little bit of traction because we like to dig in on engagement during our diligence. But the team, founding team is certainly fully formed and the, the team is, you know, more than three quarters of the signal for us. You know, we remember as entrepreneurs, right, going back to our stories, it's about that grit and resilience. And if we can find a team, ideally that's done it before together, um, that checks a lot of boxes for us, right? We say, uh, if you've had your hands around each other's necks before and you <laughs> wanna work together again, that means the world, right? For us, uh, you've been through the peaks and valleys before. Um, so anyway, we're, we're leading these seed rounds. These are typically one to $2 million checks and typically a three to, three to $4 million rounds. Um, our ownership targets these days is around 12 to 15% ownership. So that's where we're entering. This is the round before the series A, usually the first institutional round of funding. So these days there's a pre-seed round. Um, that's a relatively new concept from 10 years ago, it didn't exist, but it's the first 500 to 1.5 million into the company. And these are angels, friends and families, um, there's also pre-seed firms that can fa facilitate those investments. Um, and pre-seed's usually used to end up creating a product prototype, getting some engagement. Then the company raises a seed round that we're ideally leading. And so we'll lead that round, take a board seed. And our job is to get to the series A as quickly as possible. So we're really working with the founders to get through product market fit, doing all the dirty work, you know, um, recruiting, product, distribution, business development, sales, customer discovery, and then working really hard to raise that series A. And when we raise the A, you know, it's, it's a relay race. We're handing the baton off right. to Bessemer, Excel, Sequoia, Lightspeed, whoever might be at the A. And we're usually coming off the board at the A, certainly at the B, um, so that we can just focus on that to A stage. 
So uh, before I, that's the strategy. Before I switch into another topic, I just want to know what has anything changed? Any changes that you've seen since the pandemic at all? Like just sure. changes in company, changes in engagement. Yeah. Discover. For sure. I mean, I think COVID has has I'd say largely accelerated the software sector, um, especially the B2B SaaS software sector. I think companies are, enterprises are spending more and more against software um, that can, that basically can't get COVID, you know, uh, COVID free, COVID free software and automation um, to make things more efficient and more productive. And we've seen this trend for years, I mean, decades, right? But you know, Satya Nadella said two years of digital transformation in two months. We think it's it's been 10 years of digital transformation in some sectors mm -hmm. this year. I mean, sectors that never had to consider a digital strategy um, now have to or face dying, right? So before it was kind of like, maybe a nice to have, you remember like in two, early 2000s, like, oh, maybe we'll get a website, you yeah. know, when iPhone came out, oh, maybe we'll get a mobile app. Now it's like, okay, if you don't, you're dead. You know, if you're a restaurant and you don't offer like takeout and delivery and you're not online, you're dead. You know, if you're um, a doctor and you can't do telemedicine, uh, you're dead. So um, this was a big forcing function um, for many industries. And I think, you know, ourselves, but a lot of early stage software investors, uh, our portfolios have, have accelerated, you know, mm -hmm. pretty dramatically because of, because of, because of COVID. Mm -hmm. I think there's definitely companies on the other side. I mean, we have companies selling into like the physical office. Um, well, nobody's at the physical office. So those businesses will have to, you know, really? think about another strategy right now. Um, but anything that has to align with telecommuting, you know, teleworking, uh, healthcare, um, um, you know, so many different verticals are being disrupted. We actually published, my partner Vic wrote, um, and our associate Kristen, Kristen wrote uh, a great blog post that's on our website under the blog section on accelerants and decelerants um, in COVID. And it's a big thought experiment if you're a founder today like where you should invest your time and energy. Um, and uh, and so, yeah, we've been thinking about that a lot. Great. Um, so that's on your website? That's right. Okay, so we can go on to your website. So, yep. so you and BJ, actually, you're a co-founder. You're working on this project. I just want to talk about a little bit. Yeah. It's called the 100K Pledge. So you want to you talk about that? Yeah, of course. So, you know, put the link out too. I think it's a, what is it? A hundred K pledge.org. It is uh the hundred K pledge.com. Oh, dot com. I was totally yeah. wrong. Okay. Uh, I think it's a dot com. Uh, yeah, I'm putting it in the chat. Okay. Uh, uh, yeah. And, um, you know, since Ahimsa, we've always been, um, which is the charity we founded after 9 11, we've always been pretty, um, yeah, that's the site. All oh, right, we're at 46 billion, that's huge. So I'll talk about that in a second. But, um, you know, we've been, you know, fairly active in social justice and, you know, active in a lot of different respects. But in particular, we're very passionate about social justice. And I think one of the things that happened this summer, um, you know, post George Floyd um, and the Black Lives Matter movement that we didn't see you know, after Rodney King or even Trayvon Martin as much was this incredible, um, you know, response from the tech community and community at large on, on solutions that various companies and entities were gonna try to put forth to solve or help address the systemic racism in this country. And, we noticed these incredible acts of generosity that were living on Twitter or people's websites or blogs, um, but they were kind of fragmented. They were like all over the place. And we just had an idea to very simply aggregate all of these pledges so that they could be in one place. So you could actually do a grand total 
of pledges created that essentially represent a pledge for you know, economic justice mm -hmm. for the black community at large. Um, and let's put them in one place. And that not only gives folks an idea of how much a total number is pledged, um, but also help with accountability. Um, because there's a lot of corporations that we wanna make sure this is not just lip service for. You know, we wanna make sure this is not just a blip for. Um, you know, many large Fortune 500 businesses said, hey, I'm gonna pledge 500 million bucks. I'm gonna pledge a billion dollars. And oftentimes, okay, lip service, their stock goes up, they can help recruit some more folks, but like, are you really putting that money in the right places, right? And so we threw it up a website and you can go there, the 100kpledge.com and you can see we're at 46 billion aggregated right now. Uh, we're collecting new pledges every day and we're basically scraping pledges that exist, um, but we're also facilitating an interface for anybody that wants to create a new pledge. Mm -hmm. So if you're just a regular old human being that wants to contribute $100,000 over the next 10 years, like you can go to the website mm -hmm. and you can just pledge that you're gonna hire somebody from the black community. You're gonna don donate to an organization. You're gonna invest in the black owned business. And we're not asking for specifics, but you're gonna pledge kind of the amount in what areas. And, you know, we're gonna follow up every quarter, every year for the next 10 years. Uh, just to show progress here. Um, but it was, it was a pretty pretty easy thing that's been up. Um, it's what, we, what we've been doing for 20 years, right? Since Philly Tonight creating websites. And, um, and so, yeah, that went live last month. It, it really felt good. We've been working on it all summer, uh, since the summer. Really felt, felt good to get it out to the world. No, it was great. It, it's a great link. You put it out there. I, I pledged the tech council on there to make the yep. commitment. Thank you very much. Very much in alignment with what we've been doing in terms of listening. We've been doing a lot of listening sessions across our community. So my hat's off um, to you and VJ on this. So tell us, you know, as we wind down, I think um, you're married to someone that we might wanna, you know, hear about. I hate to say that to you, Neon, yeah. but you know, we do wanna hear about this. Person. No, it's all good. Listen, like I said in the beginning, I'm, I'm happy to get when I'm speaking, I'm happy to talk about my stuff for like 5% of the time because it, it, she's much more interesting. Um, so yeah, uh, Reshma is the founder and CEO of Girls Who Code. Um, and she started uh, Girls Who Code eight years ago um, and now you know, has taught over 200,000 girls in all 50 states um, how to code. And um, she was inspired uh, to start it Actually, she ran for office 10 years ago and right. um, here in New York City, here in this district in Manhattan. Right. In 2010 was the first South Asian uh, woman to, to run for US Congress. And um, pollster said, we get 1% of the vote. Uh, we got 19 times that, we got 19% of the vote. We still lost. Um, but during that experience, you know, she visited a lot of schools and she noticed something was very wrong. Um, in the computer labs, you know, in labs that had decent computer labs and a decent setup, um, there was a room full of boys um, and very few girls. And we've been talking about our pipeline uh, and the future of technology and our, our engineering pipeline in particular with regards to STEM. And she knew right away that she needed to, to do something to move the needle that there needed to be more girls in this in this room. And so that was her inspiration, you know, to start Girls Who Code. And now it's the largest nonprofit um, by operating budget and by uh, actual results uh, in the country uh, focused on computer science education. Um, so yeah, she's, you know, she's a living, breathing, uh, you know, inspiration to many. And um, I had nothing to do with Girls Who Code, even though I, I, I claim that I came up with a name or built the first website, but we actually, we looked at the receipts and I had nothing to do with it. So it's all, it's all, uh, it, it, it's all her. And, uh, you know, uh, the organization is, is doing great. You know, COVID was tough, I think, for a lot of nonprofits this right. year, um, especially those that were dependent on, you know, large grants from, either the federal government, local government, or 
a few companies. The great thing about Girls Who Code is it has so many different donors um, from Twitter to Google to Microsoft to Apple to Verizon. And the donor base is so fragmented that um, it was really able to survive and thrive uh, during this period. And I think now, especially with the new administration and with more of an emphasis being put in on education, I mean, there's an educator in the White House now, right? Um, that um, we hope that that these efforts will continue to accelerate. Well, you're lucky. Do you have a, I mean, I who's your better half? Much so better. We put, her, we put the link out there. So what about people in Pittsburgh who are starting companies and have ideas and are founders? Yeah, How, yeah, listen. Reach out. Yeah, I love, we love uh, nothing more than to meet great entrepreneurs as early as possible. You know, my job is to help them get to a place where we can invest. And 80% of the entrepreneurs I meet are, are like way too early for our stage, but they're just thinking about something. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, reach out to me, Nahal at ENIAC.VC. And um, I'd, love to, I'd love to be helpful. Uh, you can also, um, I'm probably more responsive. I'll get back to you on email, but I'm definitely more responsive on Twitter. And I'm just, I'll put that in here too, at Nahal Mehta on Twitter. Um, but, uh, you know, one of the things I remember as a founder is the, the my most impactful meetings with VCs um, were ones who, who definitely like passed on us, but but um, they would be incredibly generous from their network, their Rolodex. We were joking about this earlier. Nobody knows what that word means anymore. But to provide that one introduction of value. Mm -hmm. And I can remember in my career building startups you know, I probably met, I don't know, a thousand VCs, right, um, as a founder over these five startups. Um, and there's probably only like 12 memorable meetings where an investor, and none of them ended up investing, but they would end up making that introduction to me that would literally change the trajectory of my business. And I can remember each one of those moments. And that was very inspiring to me as a founder. And I want to try to recreate those moments for other founders as an investor. And so what I try to do is, um, is make at least one introduction of very high, of high value um, from our network um, to everybody we meet. And, you know, hopefully it's helpful. And um, anyway, you know, that's, you know, we're, we're playing the long game. I mean, uh, you know, I, I say li li life, is, life is short, but it's also long. And I feel like, you know, when you can connect people in a very meaningful way, um, it can it can result in amazing things, and so that's you know that that's my number one job as an investor is just connecting um, people that that deserve to be connected. So last thing is, do you think your wife will try to run again? Um, you know, I think she's re-inspired to be honest um, mm -hmm. by the events that have happened these past few days. I think uh, I think those speeches on Saturday night inspired a whole new generation of leaders as well. Um, so, yeah, I mean, I think, uh, like I said, life is long. So, um, you know, I think that's what she's, I can hear her downstairs now, you know, we're all still working from home. I think she's on the phone talking to somebody about it right now. So, um, Great. yeah, yeah, we'll, we'll see. And you guys will be the first to know, so. Yes, we wanna be. So just um, Brian points out and we're gonna wrap up, but in terms of how connections really work, we met Nihal through Rob Vessio, who's a Pittsburgher, introduced us to his sister who did some work with us at the Tech Council. She's now an Uber exec who introduced us to a marketing firm, who introduced us to VJ, and who introduced us to you. So- Yep, that, that's how life works. And you know, post, post COVID too, it's very hard to, um, we say it's very hard to meet net new people, you know, right. net new relationships. I think a lot of us have focused inward ourselves, our immediate family, mm -hmm. but like that external connection is dramatically been limited. And um, so I think the more that everybody can open up their networks, uh, you know, the better, right? And if it has to happen over email or Zoom or text or whatever, but yeah, that's that's what I'm here for. So please don't hesitate to, uh, to hit me up. So thank you. Thank you for taking the time with us. Thank you for um, doing the work and the spirit in which you do your work. It's inspiring and important. I think people forget that. They think sometimes it's only about the money. It's about helping other people build their lives. 
and the prosperity just gets contagious. So really appreciate Nihal you joining us today and being proud of Pittsburgh all the time. And uh, we have your way to access you. He said Twitter is the best way, I guess through DM on, on Twitter, even though he shared his email. And uh, stay safe. Happy holidays, happy new year as it comes up next weekend. And uh, hats off. We'll be trying to track down your wife as well and really appreciate all that you do for the world. Thank you guys so, so everyone, much. Thanks for thank having you. Me. We, um, we have a good list this week. What's going on, Jonathan? Well, tomorrow is going to be a really good show. We have uh, two life sciences companies that are in hiring mode, just talking about what we're doing when it comes to hiring people in this pandemic environment. So some good tips and tricks there. Plus, you can learn what they're hiring for. So if you're looking for a job in the life sciences industry, please tune in. Okay, great, everyone. Stay connected. Stay safe. See you tomorrow.